quite an inspirational person. You recently rode the Atlantic. Yeah. That's what I want to talk to you about. When did you start it? Yeah, we set off from La Gomera in the Canary Islands, just a little island opposite Tenerife, on December the 7th, 2011. And then we arrived into Barbados, much nicer location, on January the 21st this wow. year. So how many days was that? 45 days. 45 long days on the ocean in the middle of the Atlantic. How big was the boat? It was 23 foot, so about seven meters long, with five girls, two tiny cabins either end. Um, so to say it was intimate was um, an under, underestimation. Yeah. And what did you name the boat? It was called The Guardian, because our whole campaign was to raise awareness about human trafficking. Were you a sporty type of person before? Yeah, or? I mean, sport's very much my world. I work um, for a sports channel. I've grown up always being really sporty, but if you'd have said to me, you know, a couple of years ago, I had never rode before. Yes, done, you know, marathons and running and, you know, but never, ever had even rode before. Um, so, yeah, it was a massive challenge, massive. to say the least. So what kind of training did you have to do? We trained about um, three, four, five days a week, kind of um, about a year before, and then come six months prior to that, we were doing double sessions of a couple of hours each, sort of three, four, five times, sort of six times a week with about three months to go. Yeah. And then, uh, you, did you take the boat out for some practice runs? Yeah, so we all learnt to row. Four out of the five of us had never rowed before, so we learnt to row on, on the flat water. So for me, that was on the Thames. So um, it was really, it's such a technical sport. So having never been in a boat for, before, it was quite frustrating. But I only really had about a year to learn to row. Um, and you can lose a lot of weight on the Atlantic. So I actually whacked on about a stone in muscle as well, which was quite fun to carve and, and really really in the gym yes. loads. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you feel sick at all, nauseous? On, on the actual crossing, yes. we threw up probably every, every hour for the first seven to 10 days. One of the girls was seasick for 30 out of the 45 oh days. So really, really tough. Yeah. And yeah, I'd say that was one of the toughest things in the beginning was just having to balance on a bucket going to the toilet. So the toilet was bucket and chuck it. Um, so and whilst no, being sick at the other end. <laughs> so no bathroom facilities? No, no. None. I mean, literally, there were three rowing positions, two tiny cabins either end of the boat. You couldn't, I mean, it was like Twister trying to do changeovers. So um, it was really, really, really tough. But whilst being seasick as well, it was really challenging. So that didn't help. It. No. no. So go on, run us through the, uh, the typical schedule of each day. How did it work? Yeah. Well, the reason, the reason we actually went in December, everyone thinks it's really cold, but actually you go at that time of year because it's hurricanes, after hurricane season. And um, so you get these big southerly trade winds. So we went out in 50, 50 foot waves, kind of 30 knots of wind. So having only, you know, been on the Thames to then being 50 foot waves was just extraordinary. And then um, we rode in shift of two hours on two hours off continuously for 45 days so unless we had um problems the boat did not stop and I mean we had a lot of problems everything. so what kind of problems did you have in everything that could go wrong did go wrong and everything that could break broke I prayed before saying Lord I know this is going to be really tough as it is please can we just not have anything break but sure enough everything broke so um so the first but thing it wasn't your first uh, I, I understand that your first problem was that one of your crew decided oh, not to yeah, come two yeah, days before yeah. Yeah, so we were we were a team of six girls um, up until two days before we left, and um, she was actually the skipper, so she's the one who had um, seven, eight years sea experience. She's the one who had rowed the most and was going to navigate, so she actually... It's not actually that uncommon that people feel the pressure because it's the enormity of the challenge yes. is huge. More people have gone to Everest or to space than have rode the ocean. So less than five, four, five hundred people have ever done it. So the, the task is really daunting. So she, she really crumbled under the pressure and um, it, I don't believe it was just the right time for her. So we regrouped and, you know, divvied out the jobs amongst us and frantically learning how to navigate and everything. But and did you contemplate not going? Absolutely not. But 
No, no, you no. Thought you're still going. Because there were two reasons for us doing this. One was to raise awareness about human trafficking, and and secondly, we were going for these for these two world records, these speed attempts. So, um, so between that, amongst all of us, there was just no way that we could let kind of 18 months of, um, you know, corporate sponsorship and you know telling the world about human trafficking. Sure. And the, not yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so then what, what other things so did you, other that things went wrong? So went on wrong on day two. So basically you have a thing called an auto helm, which steers you. Um, you put in waypoints of, of your cross, your whole crossing, and then um, you have a system that basically navigates you according to your GPS. And that broke on day two. So um, instead we had to basically steer the rudder with our foot. So we foot steered for, for the remaining um, kind of two and a half thousand miles, which was um, as well as then having to row and then steer, steer the rudder with your foot was really, really tough. So that was one of the biggest problems. And then on day 15, um, our water maker blew up and caught fire. So, oh, no. Yeah, basically the hatches, um, some of them, they're quite prone to flooding because yes. it's such a small boat. So that, that flooded and then blew up. So that meant that we had um, a hand pump. So then we had to hand pump water. So then we were a rower down always. We had to hand pump water around the clock. So sometimes it would just be so hot that you were kind of almost um, having to drink what you were <laughs> hand pumping water. So. Oh, it was really tough, and, and and then the seats would break, and you know other little things. But it's amazing how creative you can be on the ocean. I mean, you can't just, you know, there was a support yacht. It was a race of 17 boats, and um, there was a support yacht, but other crews had capsized. The so six out, the 17 didn't actually make it to Barbados. So, um, and we were the only all-female crew. So it was there was a lot of respect for us at the other end because there you know we had dealt been. with the things that some of the guys had. But dealt were there with. times when you despaired a little? Absolutely. I mean, I just the first sort of seven to ten days were, um, you know, just being physically sick, the sleep deprivation of only ever having about 90 minutes sleep because it was two hours on, two hours off continuously. Um, it was just really, really tough. And um, the conditions and, um, yeah, I, I sometimes just was so fearful, the nights were so long, because um, we stayed really far north so that we would do the shortest distance, but a lot of the other crews went quite far south, so they got the kind of the hotter weather, but sometimes it just, um, the nights were so long, I would just pray or, you know, play games or sing songs, there's only so much I spy you could do in the middle of the Atlantic, but just anything, <laughs> <laughs> we'd just do anything yes. to stay awake, so it was, it was really, really tough, but... And did you see any dolphins, whales? Yeah, on day 33. So imagine after day two, we lost, um, lost sight of land in the Canaries. So then we saw nothing for 33 days. And then I remember I was hand pumping water and just gazing out into the ocean. And, and then I just saw this dolphin just jumping up and I screamed. I was like, there's a dolphin. And yeah. literally the girls came clambering out the cabins and that's the only time we stopped. And um, just to really see creation at its rawest like that, so five, five dolphins swam swam by us probably for about 20 minutes so it was amazing and and that was another reason that I was really excited to row the Atlantic was to see creation at its yeah. rawest the sunsets the sunrises and stars, um, the see? stars were just breathtaking you were just you know you had you, we, we would go for these speed attempts so you couldn't couldn't stop rowing but sometimes I just would because they would just be you'd see a shooting star and that would just keep you going spurred on for the next two hours because it was literally pitch black if the moon wasn't out or it was cloudy it was literally pitch black so the nights that there were millions of stars it was just amazing how were the relationships on the boat yeah amazing i mean you can a lot of people actually crews who have done it before a lot of them get off in barbados and don't ever want to see each other again because you see the good the bad the ugly yes. we've seen more of each other than you know our husbands to be we'll see i'm sure <laughs> um just because um yeah it, it's a really tense environment sometimes but actually and so many problems we we actually became stronger as a team and mm. and I wouldn't have changed the problems that we faced because you know it meant that we just had to work harder as a team and and actually none of us knew each other before so about a year and a half before we didn't even know each other so it's extraordinary how um, you know the team came together and and how we had everything all the skills and talents that we needed when we were actually on the ocean so that was amazing amazing now you've already mentioned that you you did this because you wanted to raise awareness yeah. uh, of human trafficking yeah. so tell us uh, when did that begin how 
how did you get motivated and yeah. aware yourself? Yeah, yeah. So about three and a half years ago, I knew nothing about human trafficking. I had just done the Alpha course at church at HTB and was really asking, Lord, what can I do to, you know, what do you want me to serve you with? You know, what do you want me to do with my time? And um, and then I was at. Um, the Hillsong Women's Colour Conference and um, heard Christine Kane, the founder of A21, talk about human trafficking. And I literally was just, my jaw was on the floor. And I just saw the statistics that, you know, there's an estimated 27 million people in slavery and that the average age of a trafficked victim is just 14 years old and how children are exploited. And I just was so shocked and um, and heartbroken. I think God just really broke my heart there and then, and I just knew that that was the start of something that was probably going to be a lifelong mission to see slavery abolished. And Saturday night outs got cancelled just because I was just, you know, just wanted to research and read. And it was just, I wanted to know more and more. And the more I read, the more I wanted to do something about it. And you know, and I kind of was frustrated for a few months as to what I could do to make a difference because the problem is so overwhelming. And um, so I kind of thought, well, what's in my hand? You know, so I work in sport, love sports, sports very much my world. And, um, and an initial half marathon, which I was signed up to do anyway, I did that for A21. And, and it's amazing how just, you know, just in social media, sort of just sure. everyone was just like, what's this thing, Julia, you're banging on about all the time? And just the awareness that you can create in your own circle. And then an initial half marathon then turned it to rowing the Atlantic. <laughs> and how, how much did you raise? For the row, yes. um, yeah. So we've raised probably about 150,000 pounds now, but we're speaking at, um, within corporations and schools, and um, hopefully the money will keep coming in. So, yeah. Now, and, and in what ways have you been tangibly involved? Uh, with A21? Yeah, so I actually work now part-time for A21, which is really exciting. And Beth Redman and I went to Greece just before the row, which gave me all the incentive to keep carrying on on the ocean when it was tough. You know, the elbows were hurting and the wrists were bruised and the legs were sore. Just having met the girls that A21 have rescued and helped restore and really rebuild their lives has just given given me such perspective on life and just really want to make a difference to this cause. And I really believe that we can, you know, one yeah. person at a time. And it is so overwhelming, but just really seeing how, you know, that money does make a difference. And yes, every penny that we raised, you know, it goes straight there and it, and it does make a difference. But if we can inspire others that, yeah, you don't have to row the Atlantic, but just use what you know, you're passionate about and yeah. use that to make a difference. Uh, the founder of A21, Christine Kane, um, she went to Greece and at the airport she yeah. noticed all these photographs yeah. of girls that were missing yeah. and, uh, and, and and we often see that in airports yeah. this is this person's missing yeah. and it was only later that she discovered that these were girls that had been caught up in human yeah. trafficking uh, just tell us a little bit more about the reality of what is going on. Yeah, I mean, basically, often, you know, I thought it was a myth that, you know, the more I researched that, you know, it was something that that went on in faraway places like India or, you know, Cambodia and in poverty-stricken countries. And yes, poverty does breed that. And, um, you know, I'd never even heard of the country Kyrgyzstan, but girls there only get educated to the age of seven, which means that then they're hungry for more education and they often prey on the vulnerability. So for a girl there, they may, you know, say to the family, look, we can take your child and, you know, give them further education. And then they're sold from what might be already a tough situation into, into a hellish situation, whether it be forced prostitution um, or forced begging. So um, I visited a safe house also in Cape Town in South Africa just before the World Cup and learned how large sporting events place demand. So I heard of girls and met girls who were being brought in from Mozambique and Zimbabwe and surrounding countries ready to really service the demand that when millions of people descend upon a city, which made me think, well, what's going to happen, you know, with the Olympics on our doorstep right here? And um, there's been 10,000 construction workers on the Olympic site, and um, therefore, as a result of that, over the last couple of years, prostitution has doubled. So it just shows that there's so much demand right here on our doorstep. And it's just, um, 
you know, it's, it's the largest and fastest growing crime in the world. And um, I remember rowing across the Atlantic and listening to um, William Haig's audio book on my iPod um, on William Wilberforce's life's work and just um, the tenacity and just the, you know, the perseverance. It's going to take an army of us to abolish this. So, you know, it is overwhelming, but I believe we really can, can make a difference. Just unpack a little bit more, Julia, about mm. the Olympics and London. Mm. Are, are, are you saying that girls are brought in intentionally? Yeah. yeah, so they might be lured under false pretenses, say a girl in Bulgaria or Moldova, you know, come to the bright lights of London and, um, you know, work as a waitress or um, some other job, and then they will be basically um, taking all their documentation and, um, you know, if they've applied for a job, you as their trafficker would have their CV and know where they live. So it's a real blackmail um, situation. And then they're basically forced into prostitution. And some of these girls are servicing 30, 40 men a day. And in, in London alone, there's one borough that has 300 brothels alone. And when I tell that to people, they're just literally you know, the jaws are on the floor because they can't believe it. It's so discreet, it's so hidden. They're just residential, discreet properties. And one child forced to beg can earn a trafficker £100,000 a year. So that's why, say, with the Olympics or um, with other other events, it's just important that people, you know, that we raise awareness so that people are aware of what's happening on our, on our doorstep. And, you know, young boys are often brought in to, um, for cannabis cultivation. And it could just be the leafy, leafy little house in the suburb that, you know, there's this going on. So I just think w awareness is so important. I mean, I didn't know about it three years ago and having spoken to politicians and so many people in this field, so many of them, you know, are only now getting to mm. grips with a problem that is so huge. Sure. Uh, Jim Wallace um, said something quite perceptive. He says it, it's, it's, it's good to rescue people yeah. from a river where they're drowning, but it's also wise to walk upstream and find out who's throwing them in. Yeah, yeah. So have you had any kind of breakthrough? Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, with A21, we want to, of course, rebuild and restore the lives of women who have been trafficked. But as you say, the demand is always there. And, um, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, Julia is the, is the oldest, um, you know, but, you know, being a prostitute is the oldest trade in, in the world. You're never going to stop the demand for that. But I think we... Um, just have to keep raising awareness and really I mean I work in the media so I believe you know I'm called for such a time as this to really sure. be in in the media to to raise awareness and and get it out there which then ultimately puts pressure on the policy makers who can bring change to this and and you know I've asked the politicians we we had the privilege of meeting Prime Minister David Cameron and you know spent time with him and told him all about the row and you know he's he's pledged to of course um you so know he was quite receptive yeah amazing he was really amazing and then to you know to to, to look into this problem further but it is such an overwhelming problem one of the MPs who we work with um, he said it cost the taxpayer about 200,000 pounds for you know a girl a girl's psychological gynecological all the problems that she faces so you can see why it's such an enormous sure. problem to tackle and it's kind of easier to keep it under the carpet but really just to, as a woman, or, uh, you know, I don't w ever want this to be seen as a women's issue because men are exploited as well in construction and, and various other ways. So I just think it's really important that, that we're aware and that we all kind of make a, a noise about this in a positive way. And, you know, I remember going in telling my, you know, my big producer at work saying, we have to cover this story in South Africa. And he was like, okay, and I told him why. And he was like, okay, Julia, we'll do it. Just shut up. I don't want to hear anymore because it's, it's just such an overwhelming problem and really it's easier to turn the other cheek. But if we can, you know, use sport or, you know, music or fashion or, you know, what, baking cupcakes and telling people why you're doing it, you know, positive ways, I think it really will make a difference. You're motivated, Julia, obviously, because the love of Christ compels you. Tell us a little bit about your own spiritual journey. Were you brought yeah. up to yeah. follow Jesus? Yeah, I was brought up. I was born and raised in Finland, in Lapland. We lived just up the road from Santa Claus. So, did you really? Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. Did you? We did, yeah. We, oh, we waved to, waved to our grandparents in Scotland, my mum's family, on yes. Christmas Day when we were young. So I grew up in a really outdoor life in minus 40, and then mum had enough of minus 40, and then we moved to Berkshire. And um, yeah, grew up in a... <laughs> bit of a change. <laughs> grew up in a Christian home, and I guess really I'm the prodigal daughter because I kind of um, 
you know, I actually had quite a tough relationship with my father and then looked for that in the wrong places. And, and, then, um, and then when a long-term relationship ended, I, um, I just knew all I deep down wanted was to run back to God. And um, it was only him that would, you know, satisfy that longing and, and, and yearning that, you know, no man ever could. And um, my sister um, had just done the marriage preparation course at HTB and she said Julia come along so so I did and there were all these Alpha testimonies um, and literally Alpha was starting on the Wednesday so I did Alpha and my life just did a complete 180 you know I wasn't you know drugs and rock and roll but I certainly wasn't I was probably living quite a lukewarm life um, and then to be planted within a local church and to be amongst a community who don't just spectate, they participate, you know, and everyone's just encouraged to get plugged in. And, sure. and, then, and then I did, and, and this cause has just completely changed and my it, life. And was it gradual? Was there a particular yeah, week I, where something happened? I think just the community actually is what really just, um, just changed my life, just just that you could really do, yes, church is important on a Sunday, but just the doing life together Monday to Saturday. So some of my best friends now um, are from that very course that I did. Um, and it was quite, um, I, I always describe it, everything that I knew of God to be true just dropped from my head to my heart. I think I, you know, I had experienced the Holy Spirit and God growing up, but actually it was really, really that, that those 10 weeks that just... Um, everything became real for me again. Yeah. It's almost like you, you know, you've got the radio, you've got the plug, it's yeah. all there, but you never got plugged in. Yeah, completely. That, it all came alive. Yeah. So you, uh, just tell us a little bit more about Alpha and for those that may not be familiar with it. So Alpha is basically um, a chance to explore Christianity for 10 weeks. So, you know, you, I, I, the reason I had never done Alpha because I thought it was for, you know, non-Christians. And I remember Nikki um, Gumbel saying, you know, if you, you know, if you're a Christian, but you just still want to, you know, do it just to meet people or, you know, just experience the course, then come along and do it. So I thought, oh, okay, brilliant. I can do it. And, sure. you know, and in every group, there's, you know, someone who's really argumentative and the quiet ones or and I was I'm definitely vocal I always asked questions and um you know and learnt by other people's answers so it's a really safe environment to explore and and as a kind of lukewarm Christian or already kind of knew um a lot about God um it just rekindled yes. that for me so it's a really powerful way to explore so you would en encourage people oh, who absolutely. do follow Jesus yeah. even to do it as a refresher yeah. course yeah or just to reevaluate yeah. and uh, reinforce their faith. Yeah, absolutely. It completely changed my life. I wouldn't have rode the Atlantic. I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't be sat here today if it wasn't for what God did through Alpha for me. So, how do you see the future, Julia? What are your aspirations? Yeah. Do, uh, what are you dreaming about? I just I feel like the adventure really starts now. As soon as we got to Barbados, I just thought, wow, the adventure really starts now because hopefully, you know, if we as five ordinary girls can do this extraordinary challenge, then God can just do anything. So I'm really excited for everything that he has and, um, you know, hoping to do other expeditions. And what, really, so what have you got in mind? <laughs> it's a top secret at the moment. Is it? <laughs> yeah. But, but, but just... But pretty adventurous. Yeah, absolutely. And really... Um, just the whole point, you know, the Atlantic was symbolic of the transatlantic slave, slave route. So we want to follow another, another route of trafficking. So probably from Eastern Europe to London, but I won't tell you how no. we're doing it yet. <laughs> but you're really up for a challenge. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you first thought about, cross, you know, rowing across the Atlantic, were you a little bit fearful that you, you know, you wanted to do it, but you may not do it? I think... Our naivety was a really good thing. There's a there's a picture of me looking out into the ocean just as we just as we left, and I look at it now and I think, oh my goodness, if I only knew then, you know, what I know now, I wouldn't I wouldn't have. Well, of course I I would do it because of this cause, and that's what kept me, and of course my faith sustained me. But um, I. Yeah, I'm just in awe of, of what God's done. I mean, looking back at it now, it's just extraordinary. That I don't think our boat officially should have got there with all the problems and, and the challenges that we had. So just by the grace of God that we got there, it was amazing. And your um, other team rowers, yeah. 
were, other, were they Christians? So one other was a Christian, um, and we would just be there in the middle of the night praying to stay awake. So the others had no hope of, of um, getting away from, from our faith. And, and actually, they, a couple of them were staunch atheists, but we, of course, spoke about God, and they just saw um, our faith at its rawest. And um, Katie, who I shared with at the back of the boat, we swapped every two hours, and I remember just experiencing this spirit of fear whenever, you know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. I know what that feels like. And I literally would just be so fearful. I would cry because these 50 foot waves were just so scary. And at nighttime, they'd just be lashing at you from all angles and then just going to bed and wringing wet clothes and then having to get up in two hours time. And I, we were all just stretched to our physical and mental limits. And so Katie would hear me talking, you know, about my struggles and how, um, and then she'd be encouraging me about my faith, you know, <laughs> Julia, keep praying and, <laughs> you know, preaching to me, which was amazing. And actually, they're very different people now. And I never felt the pressure of, oh, they're going to have to be Christians by the time we get to sure. the other end. Just just do this journey with them. And 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 I think oh, just the way we spoke about God and our faith. And actually, I remember one night, Kate and I were rowing and, and Debs. I said, Debs, I'm so sorry. I've just been praying out loud the whole time. I hope it didn't disrupt your sleep. She said, no, it sent me off to sleep. It was really soothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so no, they, they often um, talk about, you know, God now and in ways that they wouldn't have. And then Katie um, has been to church several times since. And so, yeah, I think slowly, slowly, but surely. Lots of encouragement. Yeah. Now, you actually made two records in we did your, yeah what were those we got two world records which yes. is really exciting so we were the first female five ever to do that so we got a record for that and then we're the fastest women ever to row the atlantic as well so right. but also you personally you're oh yeah that, yeah the third one being you're the, the first only fin yeah i'm the first fin ever to row the atlantic and there's lots of rowers in finland i think we did actually row on the lakes when we were young but um, so, yeah, I'm going over to Finland lots now to speak in churches and in like, youth conferences and, and just really telling the story of, you know, of, know. of Row for Freedom. And, you know, if we can do this, you can do anything. The world's your oyster. Julia, you really are an inspiration. You really are. Oh, I feel challenged, really, just, <laughs> just, just to maybe run three miles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you really are, and it's, it's lovely to hear a little bit about your, your journey of faith and your encounter mm. with Christ through Alpha and, uh, and to see how the love of Christ has compelled you uh, to do these things with the ultimate goal of raising awareness for human trafficking and seeing yeah. um, what can be done. And, uh, well, we really pray God's blessing upon you and A21, and uh, pray that you'll just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so Julia, much. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank, thank you. you. John, I support compassion and compassion supports facing the canon. Please enjoy the film. Changing the world begins with a child. This is Moses. He lives with his foster mother, Mary. She found him left for dead as a newborn baby on a garbage dump. His life is very different today, as he now receives support from a compassion project in the local church. Compassion offers each child they serve the opportunity to learn about Jesus and receive regular Christian training, educational opportunities and help, health care, hygiene training and supplementary food where needed. Together, 
All this empowers Moses to take his place in the church and the community, and to show others the way to break the cycle of poverty. It takes just £21 a month to change the story for a child like Moses. If you want to change the world, it begins with a child. It begins with you, and it can begin now.